Thank you very much, Vasilis, for this uh, uh, very exciting and optimistic, futuristic, and provocative intervention. Uh, if I could possibly summarize uh, some of the key points of uh, Vasilis's lecture, I will say that uh, Vasilis argued that we are on the verge of a huge technological advances, particularly the digitization of the healthcare systems. You will see healthcare without borders, a tremendous revolution in terms of genetics, <coughs> combined with a revolution in terms of microchips and nanotechnology. Medicine will be replaced by computer science from trust me, I'm your doctor, will move into trust me, I, I'm your computer. <laughs> and if you have a fancy computer, you can trust it a little bit more, perhaps. If it is the latest Mac computer, it might become a little bit more attractive. Uh, uh, and then very optimistic future about the uh, population aging. Uh, you millennials are going to live up to 115 years, possibly 120. The rest of us are doomed, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm referring to the first row here and me. So, yeah, case closed. So we're not going to live up to 115, unfortunately, Kevin. So tough luck. So, but we may we may manage to live a little bit longer. So. And, and all of this will be combined with uh, a revolution in terms of collecting information, with uh, lots of IT systems and wearables, uh, uh, lots of smart watches monitoring every single activity, combining this information which could be used to produce new research, monitor the quality of healthcare systems, help the pharmaceutical industry produce better drugs. They have failed to do that in the past 20 years, unfortunately particularly in cancer care, uh, the uh, advances in this particular area are very problematic with a few exemptions in the area of breast cancer, melanoma, and colon cancer. In all other cancers, all new other cancer drugs uh, have added a few weeks, two or three weeks, compared to the very traditional approaches we had since the 80s or 90s. Uh, so all this looks very good, I have to say, uh, and I'm declaring my own interest here. I belong to the skeptics rather than to those who believe that this is going to happen. I have to say because uh, some of this will happen. I'll say what, what is going to happen, and I, I buy part of the argument, but not the full argument. And the reason is that about 30 years ago, I attended one of these economist conferences. Uh, it was about in 10 years from now, the genomics revolution and the IT revolution will develop new drugs. Everything is going to be automatic. Uh, with genetics, we're going to sort out all healthcare problems and everybody's going to be happy. Uh, and, <coughs> and then again, we're here in 2018 uh, and we're still looking for the next 25 years. I'm not saying that think these things are not going to happen, uh, but we'll take some of these with a pinch of salt. So uh, I will be a little bit more skeptical. I'll say why. So even if we have all these, let's take the smartwatches. Um, so we use them to change people's behavior, for example. So if you have all these smartwatches, the theory there is that if everybody has a smartwatch, you will be obsessed. Every day you will be looking at your watch, so you'll be looking and see how many steps did I do this day. Last, last, last evening I looked at my watch uh, and my iPhone, it was only 2,000 steps. So I immediately fall into depression. So uh, I thought that today I should do 15,000 steps, but I, I abysmally failed to do that. Uh, and, and I think I looked into the past three months and it became even worse because it was on average four and a half thousand steps. Very bad performance. So, but despite this, I was not incentivized to improve my performance. And I started thinking, good old fashioned regulation might be also another approach. We shouldn't dismiss it, for example, if you look at how many gains we have achieved in healthcare because of good old-fashioned regulation, banning smoking. Hmm? We're down now from about 60% of the British smoking in the 60s down to 17%. And in 25 years from now, it's going to be 2% because of this very simple regulatory measure to ban smoking in public places. Taxing the sugar industry and the food industry so they produce healthier programs. So instead of me being obsessive looking at my smart walks all the time, you know, whether I have eaten properly or whether I have walked 15,000 steps every day, why don't I access supermarkets where there's healthier food and um, we're not influenced by the Pepsi Colas and the Coca Colas. So you're in the good part of the industry, you're trying to keep people healthy and restore your health. But there are also commercial determinants of health out there. 
So the bad industries, the food industry is not a good industry, and it's private sector. The smoking industry is not a good industry, and it's again private sector, it's not public sector. So what I'm trying to say is it's not all you know, black and white, so they're the good guys and the bad guys, and of course there's bad guys in the public sector, mm -hmm. and bureaucracy, and Vasilis is right to say that uh, there are inefficiencies in the public sector, and there are big inefficiencies. There are inefficiencies in our NHS here in Britain because sometimes you have to wait for months. Uh, and particularly for people who are Mediterranean, you know, you go to your GP, they do your test, and they tell you you're going to get your test three weeks later, which is unthinkable uh, even in a system like the Greek system, which is not as good as the British system. You get your text test next day in the private sector or the same day or two or three days later in the public sector. So this is an inefficiency, but because the NHS is such a well-organized system, with integrated data sets and, and a different ethos in terms of managing it. Uh, this MRI machine that everybody is admiring was discovered by fresh ideas within the NHS. Uh, it has been picked up by the private sector. It may become an iPhone in the future because Apple or IBM might evolve the technology, but it was developed within our public sector, not within the private sector. So you can do some good things in the public sector. Uh, and then if you look at waste, there's big waste in systems like, like the Greek system, but the biggest waste in the world is in the American system, one trillion dollars. And this is the most privatized system in the world, So, and where they're spending 18% of their GDP, uh, and they're living, you know what the life expectancy is in the United States of America? It's 77 years, and then there is an island next to uh, the United States of America, and the Americans under the Trump administration now, they're not supposed to have their holidays in this island. Hmm? It's Cuba. And the life expectancy in Cuba, they're spending um, probably 1 20th of the American wealth on their healthcare system, even less. It's the same, absolutely the same. You know, if you compare the US to Cuba, uh, life expectancy is 77 years there. So uh, it's a bit of an uncomfortable truth just to look at these facts. So. Uh, these are the things that uh, we need to consider for the future. And then the other thing is this bloody determinants of health, which is inequalities, income inequalities, education inequalities, housing inequalities, environmental inequalities, transport inequalities, are not going to be sorted out by smart technologies. They will be there unless we have political action to change the world. And this is not going to be changed because of a smartphone. It's going to be changed in different ways. Now, that's the skepticism so far, so, and, and I hope you take it as, as healthy skepticism. Uh, what I liked, I liked the idea of uh, the uh, integrated healthcare system and how the technology can help us integrate the healthcare system. This is where the public systems are very bad. So patients, particularly patients suffering from multimorbidity, those old patients suffering from two or three conditions, are wandering from one doctor to another. Uh, data sets are not integrated. The specialist doesn't bother about the GPs because they don't consider the GPs to be good doctors. They consider them to be inferior doctors. The GPs try to assert their control and they don't share their data with the specialists. The pharmacists are doing their own things. Social care organizations, their own things. The ambulance sector, they have their own data. Uh, we're not sharing data across providers with the exemption of Scotland where they're sharing their data at least at the hospital level but not here in England. So in Scotland they are uh, doing it better. Patients do not have access to their hospital data. You can have access to your GP data. Last time I visited my GP and asked for, for them to give me my, my laboratory test, they wanted to charge me 10 pounds just to print. It cost 10 pennies, but they wanted to get 10 pounds for this. But I don't have access to my hospital data and if I'm a chronic disease patient, I cannot do that, and certainly smart technologies and this revolution in, in IT can empower the patient. For example, think of a situation where you are uh, a transplant patient. You mentioned the, uh, ca uh, the case of a transplant patient. Uh, and um, you do your laboratory tests. Here you have to wait two or three weeks to find out about your creatinine levels. But what about having access to this data yourself, not your doctor, who might be a busy doctor, taking care of 100 people or 1,000 uh, renal transplant patients, and they may miss something. The creatinine may jump and they may miss it. But if you have access to your data, you're not going to miss it. Hmm? 
So the Scots got it right. So the, there is a website where all the renal transplant patients have access to their data, and they have reduced medical errors, and they have improved patient safety because they have empowered the patient to use the technology and have access to their data. Uh, so integration is important, and technological integration will integrate the private care provision and the public sector provision. One of the problems we have with the private sector, I don't know what the situation in Greece is, that here the private providers are resisting. They are not sharing their data with the public sector. They say we are commercial enterprises. We have signed legal agreements with our shareholders. This is the private business. So if we want to have level playing field, then we must have the same regulatory framework. I agree, same pricing, compare and contrast, but also data sharing. So you cannot have the same pricing system and no data sharing in the healthcare sector. So we have to measure the same outcomes in both sectors. And I very much like your idea, and I love it, hospital without walls. This is the future of the hospital. Why? Because what we have done in the past, and there are several medical doctors here, and you can question me. I used to be a doctor in a previous life. I'm probably a very dangerous one now. <laughs> so, and I'm a bit scared of Vasilis because uh, I, he spoke like a chief medical officer, didn't he? <laughs> Rather than a CEO. So he knows so much about medicine. Uh, so I know less, I have to say, at this stage of my life. So, but what I know is, since I studied medicine, medicine has become more fragmented. Uh, just pop into a hospital, you'll find about 70 specializations, so, so many subspecializations. In the field of cardiology, just look at the cardiologists, there are about 20 subspecializations in cardiology. Every simple technique they're using in cardiology, they call it specialization. So many journals, so many approaches there. Uh, and then, who is admitted to our hospitals? And that's why he's right. 70% of the people who are admitted to our hospitals are older patients. And do they suffer from a single disease? No, they suffer from at least three or four or five. But we're admitting them to a particular ward. We're not admitting them to the hostel where a team of doctors will take care of their needs. And more importantly, then we're paying the hospital on the basis of their disease. So we say the hostel will get a payment based on their disease, the main disease. So we're pushing the hostel to become even more specialized. Uh, and this is not a market failure. This is government failure. This is system failure. And therefore, we need to address this system failure. But I wish you good luck. I, I want you to do that in your hospitals, because the public sector, there will be huge resistance from the established interests. Take another example. You mentioned another good example, which I loved it, so to break the professional boundaries. Now, in this country, uh, those of you who are living here, you must have noticed that in the past three or four weeks, we had about a revolution coming from the radiologists in this country. Hmm? We don't have too many radiologists. Uh, we need another 3,000 radiologists in the UK. We don't need more, we need less because of artificial intelligence. This is one area where artificial intelligence is going to do a better job compared to doctors. But what are we going to do with the radiologists? They can become interventional radiologists, hmm? become cardiological, cardioradiologists. Talk to the cardiologists now and convince the cardiologists that the radiologists are equally competent to do a stent. I believe it, they're equally competent to do a stent. But there will be huge professional boundaries. So the hostel without walls is definitely the future because the hostel without walls will be taking care of the multi-morbid patient. We're not talking about simple elective uh, surgical operations, you know, a cataract operation or, or a hip replacement. I'm talking about the multi-morbid patient who is admitted to the hospital. And, and this is really the future, and this was really a big innovative idea. And the other thing that is very important in terms of this technological innovation is patient safety. With more data, with comparing and contrasting what is happening in the hospital, particularly in the transition of care from one provider to another, from one ward to another, because I don't think we'll manage to uh, break the walls in the next 10 years, but we'll get there, you're right. Uh, then we can identify where the mistakes are happening and then we can prevent them. Uh, and this will be a huge achievement because, again, looking into a system uh, which is, uh, for some commentators, the best healthcare system in the world, the American healthcare system, how many people are dying in American hospitals every year because of medical errors, do you know? Hmm? Close to 120,000 people. How many people are dying in the US because of HIV? about 70,000 people. So more people are dying in the US because of medical errors in American hospitals. And 
highly technological environments where this government is spending 80% <laughs> of their GDP to improve health care. So there's much work to be done, uh, and I hope that some of these ideas that I have raised today are very optimistic. Some of them, are, I don't think they will be implemented, but some of them are, others are credible, and they should be implemented in the next 20 years. And thank you very much for this very inspiring presentation. <laughs> I think we have, uh, have some time for a few questions. Yep, the lady over there. Yep. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Vasili Apostolopoulos. Well I'm sorry if I've yeah. got it wrong. <laughs> for your brilliant and terrifying um, account. Um, but what, before I say my, ask my question, I would like to put you right on the private sector and the public sector in this country. The private sector does not do any accident and emergency, and that is the most expensive side of the health service. We also pay for people to be treated in the private sector when the waiting lists are too long. So it isn't the private sector that's actually saving the NHS, it's the NHS that usually saves the private sector. If something goes wrong with a patient in the private sector, they are transferred. Okay. My question is, where do you get your money from? Are you, are you just treating private patients? What happens to poor people? Are they just cast aside? Where does the money come from for the medical okay, care? Okay, let me uh, respond to your first comment, uh, first of all. In Greece, actually, private uh, sector caters for everything. Uh, accident, emergency, intensive care units, uh, everything you can imagine. So a lot of time, uh, let's say, part of the burden is taken out of... Uh, the public sector and is uh, coming on our shoulders, especially in the cases that we are not uh, properly paid. Now, uh, our uh, income is about uh, one third uh, private pay paying, one third uh, private insurance paid, and one third uh, social security paid. So the social security patient will be the poorer <coughs> patients, will they? Yes. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Anyway, I'd have a host of questions, but I don't feel it's quite fair. Let's take a few more, and then we may return to you. So Kevin <laughs> had one, one question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. I was um, lifted and inspired by what you were saying about uh, technology. And then I saw your map that uh, technology might help patients across the world. We could have little chips in our bodies and we could be having these wearables I'd never heard of that before. Uh, and we'd all be healthier. And I thought, oh gosh, President Putin would probably determine how long I live. <laughs> 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 uh, but I was, in, I, I was inspired. But um, it picks up on something that Elias uh, referred to as well. I wonder whether technology in the future, you think, is going to... Um, exacerbate inequality or um, overcome inequality? Is it a friend mm. of social equality or not? I suppose the other um, thought I had uh, in relation to that is that um, if health depends on inequality, does this mean President uh, Trump will live forever? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will try to address uh, your questions, um, except the last comment. <laughs> uh, so um, it is true that inequalities uh, do exist, and uh, access to all these uh, uh, technologies uh, is not the same for, for everyone. However, as these technologies uh, enter the, the field, they are extremely expensive, but as they develop, uh, then they become cheaper and cheaper. So I think it's uh, a lag, actually, that uh, this technology is uh, becoming available to more and more uh, people. Any more questions? Yes. I would like to ask a, a follow-up question on, the, on your investment at the Iatrico Kendro about the Da Vinci uh, robotic surgery. So if you can give us, it's something that you invested in as you very nicely described. Did it pay off in terms of patient satisfaction, patient outcomes, and because you are a private institution in terms of um, uh, income from, from the Da Vinci as, as a sort of tangible example of use of technology in your institution? Uh, thank you, that's a nice question. Uh, 
because um, all uh, decisions uh, when investment comes are not uh, based purely on uh, uh, financial, let's say, uh, criteria. It's also uh, reputation that counts, uh, uh, the, the will, the desire to be in the forefront of medical uh, technology. But at the same time, when your uh, horizon is, uh, is long term, uh, then you will not uh, lose. Maybe in uh, the first, uh, because now we are maybe in the 12th or 13th year that we uh, employ these uh, robotic systems and we have been continuously upgrading, upgrading the system. So if you take the first three year span or five year span, uh, we may uh, run in red figures, but it's a long term investment and uh, actually it, uh, it pays off in the longer term. Yes, Christopher. The way I understand your ideas is that you watch and you trace the current, what you call, revolution of digital technologies, medical technologies in your case mostly, which indeed uh, we all know, we hear every day, we read, read every day, that they are developed at various places, mostly in the US, but in some other places, China a lot, Europe some of them, as we speak. There is no doubt that there is a huge wave at the moment of technological innovation. But on the basis of this, and the potential that you traced, yeah, I think it's fascinating, and probably quite a lot of that is within our technological grasp. But then you make a leap, as I understand, and you say that all of this will take its place in our societies, and in our healthcare systems. And the way you think or you suggest that it will happen is through the private sector, yeah? So it's the market that you suggest that will make use of these technologies and they will become healthcare systems. They might, I think, from where I stand, but there is so much organizational work that needs to happen. It's a little bit what Elias mentioned, issues of integrating. Yes, we might have the capacity to integrate data that are collected in hospital and GPs and also <coughs> by individuals, but how organizationally we integrate those data is a totally different game. It's a totally different process. And I wonder if, as you are developing these ideas and projecting to the future, you have also followed studies or did some research, or you can tell us from your experience how organizationally we might be able to utilize these technologies so that they are converted and they become a healthcare system. Because it's not just an automatic step by the fact that the technologies exist and by the fact that we allow the market to uh, take its course, we are going to have and that's beyond, by the way, I agree with you, the various isms. It's not a matter of it is a capitalist or social system or whatever. It's purely nitty gritty organizations. How do we change? How we develop the institutions? How do we develop the practices where doctors, technologies, and uh, various institutions <coughs> get in the position of utilizing these technologies to make new healthcare systems. It's not an automatic uh, uh, step as far as I know. There's a question, but I don't know if you want to take Yes, of course, we can take two or three questions right. now. So yeah. very quickly, I see here in the title, The Future of Healthcare, View from Greece. And uh, I was wondering, Dr. Apostolopoulos, where do you see Greece in this changing map of global healthcare? Where do you see Greece in the future of healthcare? Does it have a spot? Okay, and final question, yeah, please. Hi, thank you for the talk, it was very interesting. Um, as a follow-up to the latest question and the funding question, dreamers such as Da Vinci, you said that you're one-third state-funded, one-third private, one-third insurance. Would those kind of treatments still be, in part, um, subsidized by the, so say, NHS for NHS patients in Greece? As in, would that patient still have access to the treatment in your unit? So let me make uh, let's say a quick uh, 
remark on its uh, question or statement. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, uh, healthcare and especially uh, researching and uh, advancing the technologies is a, is a capital intensive, uh, uh, let's say, uh, thing. So, uh, the private sector has better access to, uh, to capital and in a better position to, to finance this, uh, this progress. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, once the products and services are uh, developed uh, enough, then there is a diffusion of this, uh, of this technology. And uh, this technology goes everywhere. So it's not, uh, you know, something the private versus the, uh, the public uh, issue. Now to come to uh, where Greece actually stands uh, in this uh, new, uh, let's say, era for, for healthcare. I believe uh, very much that, uh, and uh, uh, I mentioned in the beginning of, uh, of my uh, talk today, that uh, uh, eventually uh, patients will be uh, free, let's say, to, to choose the country they want to be treated, the hospital, and uh, the doctor. Uh, and uh, actually it is uh, forecasted that uh, in the next uh, years, uh, maybe 3% of uh, uh, all those treated in uh, uh, hospitals uh, may travel for uh, the, the treatment. So Greece has a, a big opportunity uh, in the medical uh, travel. It's an evolution of uh, the term me uh, medical tourism, now uh, the most contemporary, let's say, uh, terminology is medical travel. So Greece, uh, if uh, we'll combine uh, the state-of-the-art uh, hospitals that uh, a number of them do exist in, in Greece indeed, uh, plus the human capital, the Greek doctors, uh, and uh, this is uh, by definition uh, correct uh, since the Greek doctors, uh, you can find actually Greek doctors in uh, every uh, contemporary uh, country in the system. Uh, so the human capital, the state-of-the-art hospitals is, uh, is there. If on that uh, we, we add, let's say, elements of our uh, heritage, uh, for instance, uh, Mediterranean uh, um, diet or uh, elements of uh, wellness and uh, well-being, uh, then we can uh, uh, put together a product uh, that will be very attractively uh, placed in this uh, very competitive uh, uh, medical travel uh, uh, industry. So I think, uh, of course, Greece is well known for its uh, touristic uh, product uh, and not uh, medical tourism, but uh, it lies to, to all of us uh, to act as uh, ambassadors for uh, our country uh, in order to create uh, awareness and uh, hopefully uh, put, the Gre put Greece in uh, the healthcare uh, map. And uh, uh, finally, could you briefly remind me what was it? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to understand why the essentially tier system in the sense Right, right, yes, yes. So it's, it's very complicated to explain you the, the Greek system, but basically uh, everyone uh, employed uh, in, uh, uh, in Greece has a social security. So this uh, social security has uh, contracts uh, with uh, private uh, providers for the, their uh, patients, and therefore they have access to the, uh, to the services. And the Social Security pays for them, not fully, not at a timely manner, but I will not complain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much again for this fascinating presentation. <laughs>